Good morning, Grace Point. We're about to begin worship. Come join me this morning. Please stand if you can. Let's worship our great God. Amen. Come, let us worship our King. Come, let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. See what our Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquered the grave. You free every captive and break every chain, oh God. You have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh, Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high, oh God. You have done great things. You've been faithful, you've been faithful through every storm. You'll be faithful forevermore. You have done great things. And I know, and I know you will do it again. For your promise is yes and amen. You will do great things. God, you do great things. Oh, hero. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquer the grave. You free every captive and break every chain. Oh, God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh, Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh, God. You have done great things. Hallelujah, God. Above it all. Hallelujah, God. Unshakable. Hallelujah, you have done great things. And break every chain, oh God, you have done great things. Come on, we dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high, oh God, you have done great things. You have done great things. Oh God, you do great. God, you do good things. Amen, amen. God bless you and be seated. I want to read you a little part of a story from the Old Testament about Elijah when he was in trouble. Elijah, when he was alone, he found himself on the run from Jezebel, and he really was fearing for his life, and he comes to a place, and listen to what the Bible says. It says, the word of the Lord came to Elijah, and God said to Elijah, what are you doing here, Elijah? (laughs) What are you doing here? It's a great question. 
What are we doing here today? I wonder if God were to whisper to you this morning, what are you doing here? What's going on? How are you? Where, where are you at? I wonder if we were really honest, if we'd say maybe, well, I'm alone, or I'm, I'm afraid, or I'm struggling, or I'm hurting. Uh, he says, what are you doing here, Elijah? And Elijah replies, he says, I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. He said, the Israelites, they've rejected your covenant. They've torn down your altars. They've put your prophets to death with the sword. He says, I'm the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me. The Lord said, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord. God said to Elijah, when you're hurting, when you're alone, when you're afraid, he says, what you need to do is you need to go out by yourself and you need to get in my presence. Go stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord. And he says this, for the Lord is about to pass by. The Lord is about to pass by. The Bible says where two or three gather in his name, there he will be in our very midst. <clears throat> if the Lord were to pass by today, I wonder if we would sense his presence. I wonder if we would hear his voice. He says, the Lord is going to pass by. And then listen to these words. It's an amazing story. Then a great, powerful wind tore the mountains apart, shattered the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, there was an earthquake. But he says the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there came a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. He wasn't in the hurricane, the swirling struggle all around him. He wasn't in the, the earthquake when the, the earth beneath his feet was shaking. He wasn't even in the fire, the trial that sometimes we go through. All that's going on, all the noise around us. But he says, but the Lord wasn't in the fire. And after the fire, my Bible says, there came a gentle whisper. King James Bible, I think, says, there came a still, small voice. And God whispered hope and healing and help to Elijah through that still, small voice. We're here today because we believe that Jesus is going to be passing by. And we want to hear from him. Do you want to hear from God today? Let's bow our hearts together and pray. And those of you that are joining us online, let's pray that God will use this time for us to just stand as if we were standing on a mountain waiting for him to pass by. And let's ask God to give us the grace Help us to, to just put away all the noise and all the distractions and commit this time to him that he might speak through that still, small voice and call us to himself. Father, in Jesus' name today, we come before you and we thank you that we can come before your throne of grace to find help in time of need. And Lord, we do pray that today your spirit would come and be with us that, Lord, you would be in us and, and, Lord, you would fill this room and fill this place, fill our hearts with your truth, with your word. Lord, we pray that every person that's here today would hear you speak their name, that you would meet each one of us at the point of our need. We know that there are some here, here today, maybe some listening online, that right now in this moment, they're standing in front of a cave. They're afraid. They're feeling chased. They're feeling beaten, discouraged, frustrated. And Lord, today, we just ask that you would come and help us and give us hope and give us comfort through your presence, through your voice, through your word. Lord, we pray for some that may be here today that have never received Christ as their Savior. Father, in this hour, we pray that you would knock on the door of their heart. They would open the door and they would let Christ come in and change them, forgive them, come and live within them. That they might have a new life through Jesus Christ. And Father, we pray that everything that's said, everything that's done, every word we sing, everything we do here today, would honor you. You said if, if you were lifted up, you would draw all men.
to yourself. So Lord, we just thank you that you are God. You are a shield about me, my glory, the lifter of my head. Lord, I pray that you would lift our heads today and encourage us by your spirit as we fellowship together and as we fellowship and worship you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
Amen. <clears throat> Did you know that the average person speaks between 125 and 175 words a minute? How many of you are on the lower end of that scale? And how many of you are sitting next to a person on the higher end of that scale? Right? <clears throat> Somewhere around 150 words a minute that most of us speak. Did you know that research and science tells us that the average person can hear about 450 words a minute? You've heard the old saying that God gave us two ears and one mouth so we should listen twice as much as we speak. It's actually true. 
The reality is we can and should listen. You know, so much of our lives are made up of communication. Science, uh, scientific research tells us that we spend 70 to 80 percent of our time in some form of communication. And how many of you would like to learn how to communicate better? In other words, one of the ways that we get close to people and one of the ways that we can get close to God is by learning to listen. We're going to talk today about the voice. We're going to begin a new series this morning. And if you'll take your Bible and turn to Isaiah chapter 40, we're going to be talking today about God's voice of comfort. And we're going to talk about why we should listen to God. Isaiah chapter 40, let's begin reading in verse 1. Isaiah 40, beginning in verse 1. It says, Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem. Proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. Then this famous passage that's quoted in the New Testament about John the Baptist, the prophet Isaiah says in verse 3, Isaiah says, A voice of one calling in the wilderness, Prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level, the rugged places a plain. And the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all people will see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice of one. The voice of God. It's a voice of comfort. I want us to bow our hearts together. Let's pray that God would speak to us here this morning. Lord, we pray that you would open our minds, open our hearts, open our ears, open our eyes to your truth. And Lord, I pray that we would hear that still, small voice today as we gather in worship. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. How many of you have ever seen the movie or read the book by Nicholas Evans, The Horse Whisperer. Are you familiar with this story? Are you aware of this idea of these people that train horses and work with certain animals that are called whisperers? There are dog whisperers, and there's a famous horse whisperer. And uh, in the book, uh, there's a great scene where this woman is talking to this guy who happens to be Robert Redford, and he's the horse whisperer, and she comes to his farm in Montana, and she says to Tom Booker, she says, Tom, I understand that you help people with horse problems. And Tom Booker looks at her, and he says, no, ma'am, you misunderstood. He said, I don't help people with horse problems. I help horses with people problems. The idea of being a horse whisperer goes all the way back to the 1850s, late 1850s, where a man named John Solomon Rainey was working with animals and, and, and found this technique. And what he, what he found was the secret was to try to make the horse feel safe and secure that often the hostility of horses and horses that were untamable and wild and would hurt people, he said what he found was the hostility of the horse was rooted in fear that the horse had. So the more you understood the animal, not just what the animal was doing, the animal's biting or kicking, but understand why the animal is doing what it's doing You could help. And he said that his goal was to try to make the horse feel safe and secure. And uh, and he was very effective. In fact, Queen Victoria brought John Solomon Rainey all the way to Windsor Castle because her horse had had some kind of traumatic experience and wouldn't let her ride it anymore. And she loved the horse and she wanted, she found that there was this man that was like a magician with animals. And so, 
sure enough, Rainey went there and he dealt with the horse. And within a few moments, he had the, the horse totally calmed down. She was so overwhelmed, she gave him $100, which in 1858, you know, would be a ton of money. And, of course, his name and his fame spread throughout England. And so when he, when he became famous and well-known, they, uh, they started trying to find crazy animals. In other words, they were trying to trip him up. And there was this one horse called Cruiser that was the fiercest animal and, uh, in all of England. And so they brought Rainey to the horse, and uh, no one would even go into the stable alone. Uh, without the horse being sedated. And so, sure enough, he opens the door, he goes in, he shuts the door. No one heard a sound for three hours. And after three hours, Rainey came walking out with Cruiser, with no muzzle, as gentle as a lamb. The people were so amazed that they gave the horse to Rainey. He took it back to the United States it lived out the rest of its life on his farm. And when John Rainey died, nine years before the horse died, the horse went back to being unruly and fierce and hostile. <clears throat> I wonder if there's a picture for us in this story. You know, the Bible says that the horse has to have a bridle, but that the person who loves God has a sense of self-control. In other words, the horse has a, has a rider and a bridle, but he says, if you know God, you should, you should trust God. Jesus said, my sheep, he might as well have said, my horses, they hear my voice, they listen to me, they know me, and they follow me. I want to talk to you today about uh, not a horse whisperer, but I want to show you in this passage here in Isaiah 40 that we just read, I want to share three whispers from heaven that tell us why we should listen to the voice of God. Look at what it says, and first of all, in Isaiah 40, beginning in verse 1. Isaiah 40, verse 1, he says, now this is God speaking to Isaiah at a time when the children of Israel are in the Babylonian captivity and they're, they're hurting and they're, they're suffering and, and they're, 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 they're struggling. You might say that their relationship with God is kind of hostile at that point. And its hostility is rooted in fear of everything that they've been through and all the pain that they've suffered. And God says to Isaiah, go speak to my people. And he says, give them this message. Comfort, comfort my people says your God. Now just look at that word comfort. Comfort, comfort. In the Hebrew, the root word means to sigh or to breathe deeply, to breathe heavy. On the count of three, everybody give me your best sigh. You ready? One, two, three. Ah. Now, when you're talking to somebody and you hear that sound, you can tell that it, something's happening on the inside. This word speaks of of, of, of God's care and consolation and concern for his people. It says comfort, comfort. In the Hebrew, whenever words are repeated like that, it's a poetic device. It, it's for emphasis. We, we all, you often hear the phrase king of... What? This is not a trick question. King of kings, lord of, holy of, holies. So he says comfort, comfort, this is his way of highlighting, underlining, exclamation point. He says, listen, I want you to comfort. I want you to care. I want them to know that I care for them. And it's not just something I write on a piece of paper. It's something that I, I feel deeply. It's visceral. It's emotive. He, he's, he says, comfort, comfort my people. He says, um, uh, I want, I want them to know how much I care for them. If you have something to write with, maybe you got one of those little listening sheets as you came in. You can jot down. The first whisper is this. Why should I listen to God? Number one, because God speaks to my deepest need. See, one of the reasons I want to listen and I want to hear from God is because God doesn't waste words. He doesn't mince words. He says what he means, and he means what he says, and he speaks to our 
deepest need. God didn't say, Isaiah, I want you to tell those people, as soon as 70 years are up, they can come home and everything's going to be fine. I'll have Ezra rebuild the, the, the temple. I'll have Nehemiah rebuild, rebuild the wall. A few hundred years later, I'm going to send Jesus into the world. Everything's going to be cool. They got nothing to worry about. He, he didn't say that. What he said was, I know they're hurting and I want you to comfort them. He, he identified with them. The same concept is found in the New Testament. Look at 2 Corinthians 1, verses 3 and 4. 2 Corinthians 1, verses 3 and 4. Paul says to the church at Corinth, that was a church in real trouble and trial and tribulation, he says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion, the God of all comfort. Look at verse 4. Who comforts us, In all our, what? Troubles. That word trouble speaks of pressure. It speaks of compression. It's not talking about the external circumstance. It's talking about the internal pressure and feeling that is the result of something on the outside. God comforts us in all our trouble so that we can, what? Comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. Paul is saying to the Corinthians, I know you're hurting. I know you're in trouble. I know that you're struggling on the inside. and I'm here to bring some hope and some help and some healing and some comfort. And he says, God will comfort us so that we can comfort others. I'll give you a beautiful picture of this. The word comfort there is the same root word that's used for the Holy Spirit in John 14, 15, and 16. When Jesus said, I will give you another helper. I will send you another advocate. One translation actually uses the word, I will send you another comforter. It's the same word that's used here in Corinthians when he talks about how God comforts us. He's the God of all comfort, and it means to call to one side. So you've got this Old Testament word picture of the sigh, this, this, this pity. This, it turns his stomach to see people suffer. You have this New Testament picture of somebody coming alongside in an intimate way to get, to get up close and personal and to care about what we're going through. How many of you are familiar? How many of you are awake and alive today? Can I see your hands? How many of you are awake and alive enough to know that... Johnny Depp and Amber Heard and Will and Jada Smith seem to be the two hallmarks of American pop culture at the moment, right? Um, Rich, famous, beautiful people who are hurting. They're not in the Babylonian captivity. They're in the Hollywood, Californian captivity. They're struggling. They're hurting. And, and, and basically, through their behavior, they're crying out for help, right? Are you aware that after Will Smith had his little meltdown and his, his tantrum at the Academy Awards, do you know who came running up to his side at the, at the commercial break? Denzel Washington and Tyler Perry. And according to interviews with both Will Smith and Denzel Washington, do you know what they did in that moment? Here's what they did. Two friends came alongside him and prayed for him. Now, friends, that is the picture of what that word means. To comfort somebody is the same word we get for the Holy Spirit. It's the same cognate word, so that it means it's someone who's coming alongside of you to help you and care for you. See, one of the reasons why you ought to listen to God is that God speaks to our deepest need, and that need is comfort, to know that he cares, to know that he loves us. Look at what it says in Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 to 16. 
Hebrews 4, 14 to 16. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. Verse 15. For we don't have a high priest who is unable to, what? Empathize. How many of you have a King James version of the Bible? Anybody got the King James or the New American Standard? It doesn't say empathize. It says we don't have a high priest who is unable to sympathize. So it's this idea of God's sympathy, God's empathy for his people. But we have one who's been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Look at verse 16. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with what? Confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in time of need. Now, how many of us here today need some help? And how many need that help in the form of mercy and in the form of grace? Mercy is when you don't get what you deserve. How many people would like some mercy today? I don't want to get what I deserve. (laughs) I want the mercy of God. And I want to hear the voice of comfort saying, I'm not going to give you what you deserve. I'm going to give you mercy. How many of you want grace? Grace is when you get what you don't deserve. And the voice of God's comfort says, I'm going to give you mercy, I'm going to give you grace. And listen, the mercy and grace of God is really all the help you need in a time of need. I don't believe that that verse teaches that God will solve every problem you have. What it says is, God will come and enter into that problem and give you mercy and grace to help you through that situation in a time of need. So what does it mean? Does God sympathize with us? Or does he empathize with us? You know what the difference between sympathy and empathy is? Sympathy means to share the feelings of another. Empathy means to be aware and care about the feelings of another. So are you ready for our Bible pop quiz? Does God sympathize or empathize with his people? Just nod your head like this. Yes, all of the above. See, all of the above. Friend, he shares our pain and he cares about our pain. God cares deeply. And the voice of comfort, the voice of God, we ought to listen to God because here's what he's whispering. He's saying, I'm going to speak to your deepest need. But there's a second reason. Look at this. In verse 2, he says, speak tenderly to Jerusalem. Now, this is the gospel according to Elvis, right? Love me tender. He says, speak tenderly to, uh, to my people. You ever notice that it's not so much sometimes what someone says, but how they say it that matters? Speak what? Tenderly to Jerusalem. Proclaim to her. And then he's going to say three things. First of all, he says that her hard work has been completed. Now that phrase, hard work, translated in NIV, it can mean battle. It can mean somebody like a soldier in war. It can mean a slave, somebody in bondage, somebody out in a field, working a field, bricks without straw. You know, it can mean somebody in battle or somebody in bondage. But either way, he says your hard work, your hard service is now over. It's completed. And he says, secondly, that her sin has been paid for. And thirdly, he says, not only is your sin paid for, but just in case you didn't understand it completely, let me tell you what that means. That she has received double for all her sins. She has received from the Lord double for all her sins. If you have something to write with, jot this down. Why we should listen to God is not only that he speaks to my deepest need, but he, he speaks from his amazing grace. God speaks, the voice of God always comes from a redemptive place, not a punitive place place. God's nature is not punitive. It is redemptive. Do you realize that the judgment and discipline of God is ultimately redemptive in nature? Why does God judge people? 
Why does God discipline his children? Because he's an authoritarian by nature? Because he's just a hard shell, drill sergeant kind of? No. The reason God disciplines us is because he really loves us and doesn't want us to hurt. And he knows that sin always brings sorrow. Sin always makes you sick. The wages of sin is death. God doesn't want you to be sick. God doesn't want you to sorrow. God doesn't want you to die. God wants you to live and be blessed. So he disciplines our, our, our destructive choices because he loves us and he wants the best for us. And so he always speaks. His voice of comfort always comes from his amazing grace. Now, amazing grace, obviously, is probably the most famous hymn, you know, in the world. But let me give you three other hymns that you can just write down there under this second principle. Because we're going to take these three little phrases, and basically, there's a hymn about each one of these phrases. Notice what it says, first of all. He says in verse 2, speak tenderly to Jerusalem. Proclaim to her, her hard service has been completed. Her, her hard service is over. What's he talking about there? He's saying, I see you. I, I know where you've been. I've watched from heaven as you were taken into captivity. I'm aware that this has been very hard and difficult for you. God is saying, basically, I see you. You, you remember when Bill Clinton was president years ago and, and kind of his, his shtick was in the media that uh, they would always joke about him saying, I feel your pain. Have you ever heard that? <clears throat> well, people can laugh about it all day long, but he did win twice. People like people who feel their pain who can empathize and understand what people are going through. And the Bible says, your hard service, he was aware of what they'd been through. I, he says, speak tenderly to them. Here's a hymn, Softly and Tenderly, Jesus is Calling. You ever heard that song? Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling. That's what he's saying there. He's saying, I see you, that you've been hurting You've been suffering. Look at what he says next in verse 2. He says, your, your service is completed and that her sin has been paid for. Just write this down. Jesus paid it all. You ever heard that hymn? Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. It's paid in full. Not only does God say, I see you, I'm aware of your hurt. I'm aware of your struggle. But he says, I forgive you. I'm willing to forgive you. If you're here today, and like Elijah, you're standing on the mountain waiting for the Lord to pass by. You know what he's saying to you today? He's whispering, I see you. I forgive you. Jesus died on the cross to take the penalty and the punishment of our sin. And he offers us forgiveness. He offers us a new life through Jesus Christ. He says, I see you. He says, I forgive you. You know why horses are hostile? It's because they've been hurt. And they're afraid of getting hurt again. You know why people are hostile and toxic? Because they've been hurt. You ever heard the saying, hurt people, hurt people? Jesus says, here's what you need to hear today. I see you. Nobody else in this room may see you, may know, may be aware of what you're going through. But God says, I see you. And he says, I'll forgive you. Look at the third thing. This is beautiful. He says, your service is completed. Your sin is paid for. Listen to this. That you have received from the Lord's hand, what? Double for, for all your sin. What is he saying? He's saying that God's grace is exponential. That, it, that it's more than you need. For him, the, the grace of God is enough. It, can, it doesn't just forgive your sin. 
It pays for double all, your, all of your sins. So if you're here today and you feel like, boy, I don't know if God could really forgive me. Like you think Jesus stretched out his arms on Calvary, was nailed to a cross. He said, I love you this much. And you're afraid that because of your sin and your past and your shame, that maybe the grace of God could just barely forgive you if you're lucky. Isaiah 40 verse 2 says, yeah, you don't understand the, the grace of God. That his, his grace is double for all your sin. Remember when Jesus said, they said, how many times should I forgive? Should I forgive seven times? Jesus says, no, 70 times seven. What is he saying? He's saying it's exponential. That's what grace is. It's exponential. It's double for all of our sin. Pastor Paul, can I pick on you for a minute? I didn't tell him I was going to do this, <clears throat> but I did whisper to his wife I might do it. Have you got your phone? Have you got the first verse of grace that is greater than all our sin? Sing that first verse for everybody and the chorus. And if you know the chorus of this song, sing it with Pastor Paul. You ready? Listen to these words. Can I get an amen on that? How many of you How many of you are glad that God's grace is greater than all my sin? It ex, his grace exceeds my sin and my shame. I'm going to tell you something friend, God speaks from his amazing grace softly and tenderly. Jesus is calling. Jesus paid it all. Grace that's greater than all my sin. What is he saying? He's saying, I see you. He's saying, I forgive you. If you'll come to me, if you'll confess, repent of your sin, he says, I'll forgive you. And he says, I love you. I love you more than you could ever understand. You ever heard of the prayer of Jabez? Have you ever heard of the uh, walk through the Bible ministries? Bruce Wilkinson uh, is a Christian leader, well-known across the country, and uh, he founded Walk Through the Bible Ministries. He's written several uh, best-selling books. The Prayer of Jabez, at one point, I think, was the best-selling Christian book of a decade or something. And uh, so he's a big-shot preacher, and he knew everybody, and, and uh, he spoke all over the country to thousands of people and, and had this tremendous ministry. His professor in seminary was a guy named Howard Hendricks. Howard Hendricks taught Bible study methods at Dallas Seminary for years and years and years. And most of the really effective Bible teachers in America, these great pastors in churches all over the country, it is amazing how many of them took Bible study methods from Howard Hendricks. Most people never heard of Howard Hendricks, but they've heard of people like Chuck Swindoll, Bruce Wilkinson, John MacArthur, Andy Stanley, on and on and on. These are all people that studied with Howard Hendricks. Well, something happened. Howard Hendricks and Bruce Wilkinson had a conflict. They had a, 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 an issue, some tension. They had some trouble. And I don't even really know what it was about, but there was some kind of a personal conflict between Bruce Wilkinson and his mentor, his hero, his father figure in the ministry, and that there was this struggle. They didn't agree about some issue or something, and so... Bruce felt that there was this, this tension. Remember that verse, God comforts us in our trouble? It wasn't anything on the outside, but it was just something on the inside. Have you ever been in a tension-filled room or relationship or situation? And so they wound up both speaking on the platform at the same conference in some big city, thousands of people there. Wilkinson was going to speak. Hendricks was going to speak. Bruce Wilkinson was nervous about being around Professor Hendricks, and he, he kind of didn't know what to expect. Have you ever been in a situation where you just didn't know 
whether they were going to speak to you or whether you should speak to them or something like that. And so he, he was awkward and he, he felt uncomfortable and he turned around and there was little Howard Hendricks with his bald head and his big glasses standing there in front of him. And Bruce looked at him and he was speechless. He was just kind of like, what am I going to do? And Howard said, Bruce, don't you know that I love you? He said, we don't have to agree about everything, but I don't want you to ever doubt my love for you. He said, Bruce, he put his hands on his shoulders. He said, Bruce, there is nothing you will ever do that will make me love you any more than I already love you. And there is nothing you will ever do that would make me love you any less. You know, I think that's something God wants to whisper to you today. That, friend, his love for us is not based on us. His love for me is not based on me. His love for you, it's not based on you. It's based on him. Look at what it says in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 16 to 19. Ephesians 3, 16 to 19. Paul says, I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. How many of you want God's power and strength in your life? Remember when we talked earlier that God offers mercy and grace for help in time of need? That doesn't mean he solves all of our problems. It means he gives us his mercy and grace so that our problems don't look so big anymore. And he says, here, I'm praying that he'll strengthen you. He says, I'm going to give you power. What does that mean? Is he going to give you, are you going to be Superman? Are you going to be Wonder Woman? You're not going to have any more trouble. You're not going to have any more problem. Look at verse 17. What does it mean? How does he strengthen us? So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And then I pray that you being rooted and established in what? In love. Verse 18. (coughs) May have power. What do you need power for? What's the strength that we need? He says, I want you to have the power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp. Everybody just do this for a minute. Will you just take your finger and knock on your little noggin there? I want you to be able to grasp what? How wide, how long, how high, how deep is the love of Christ. Look at verse 19. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. What does it mean to be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God? To be strengthened in the inner man. What it means is you know, you grasp, you have that comfort. You can sigh and say, oh but at least God loves me. Do you hear me? Jesus is saying, Carlos, there is nothing you could ever do that would make me love you more than I already love you. Jesus is saying, Jonathan, there is nothing you could ever do that would make me love you any less. He says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Why do I listen to God? Why should you listen to God? Isaiah says, because he speaks to your deepest need. God says, because I speak from my amazing grace. Number three. Look at what it says in verses three through five. It says, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up. Every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level. The rugged places a plain. And the glory of the Lord will be revealed. And all people will see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. You know that word in verse 3 that says voice? It's an interesting word because it speaks specifically to the sound of one's voice. 
In other words, it's a voice that could be used of a mockingbird or a blue jay. It's a, it's a voice of a lion or a horse or a dog barking or a cat meowing. When he says the voice of one, he's talking about the sound of God's voice, the sound of the prophet's voice. Have you ever heard the, the old question, if a tree falls in the forest and no one's there, does it make a sound? If God speaks in a whisper and nobody hears it, is God still speaking? Friend, a lot of people think God doesn't speak to them. And I'm going to tell you, the trees are falling in the forest all the time. Every time you open God's word and read the scripture, the voice of God is speaking. He's speaking a word of comfort. He's saying, I see you. He's saying, I forgive you. He's saying, I love you. He's saying, I care for you. He's saying, I share your hurts, your feelings. I sympathize. I empathize. Here's what he's saying in verse 3 through 5. Write this down, number 3. God not only speaks to my deepest need and from his amazing grace, but friends, God always speaks for your greatest good. Whatever God is saying, I promise you, it's going to help you. It's going to give you hope. It's going to give you healing. It's going to strengthen you in the inner man that you may grasp how wide and how far and how long and how deep and how high is the love of God in Christ. There's a video I want to show you. You know, we talked earlier about Will Smith at the uh, Oscars. Well, that was the 2022 Oscars where the slap heard round the world happened. Any of you remember the 2021 Oscars? You know what it's famous for? The 2021 Oscars actually became well known for a commercial that played during the Oscars. In fact, several people, famous people, went on Twitter later and said the Oscar for Best Picture goes to Google for this commercial. Are you ready? David, make sure the sound is up where they can hear it. Let's call the coda. My parents were both born deaf. I was not. When people in the hearing world learn that about me, they always want to know more. You start out your forehead and then go out with your hands. I've always had one foot in the deaf world one in the hearing world. I translated a lot for my parents. It made us closer. Now that it's been over a year since we've seen each other in person, communication is more important than ever. Especially with this guy. It's their first time being grandparents, so they don't want to miss a single moment. can't wait for you to meet him. Does that give you some idea of a God who longs to reach out to his people and to speak to them and for them to hear the sound of his voice? Incidentally, do you know what movie won the Academy Award for Best Picture this year? Very few people remember anything about the Oscars other than the slap. Do you know the movie that won? It was a movie called Coda. The uh, Best Supporting Actor went to a deaf actor. The movie is a story of a, of, a, of a family with a child of deaf adults where this girl is the only person in the family that can hear in a fishing community in Gloucester, Massachusetts. And it tells about the trials and the struggles and the turmoil of that family. And it's a beautiful, beautiful picture 
of the power of community, the power of fellowship, the power of love and comfort. And isn't it interesting that many people don't know anything about it because of all the noise, all the hurricane winds and earthquake shaking and fires on Twitter and social media that we can't hear the still, small voice when God says, I speak to your deepest need. I speak from my amazing grace. And friend, he always speaks for our greatest good. What was the voice of one crying in the wilderness? He was saying to people in Babylon, far, far away from Jerusalem, from the temple, far from home, the voice of one said, listen, you see a wilderness? You see a desert? You see a a rough and rugged terrain between where you are and where God wants you to be? He said, listen, God's in the business of making a way where there is no way. He puts a highway in the desert. He, He cuts through mountains and builds up valleys. And where God will make a way where there seems to be no way. And friend, God speaks today. And he speaks for your greatest good. So I want to ask you a question. Why should you listen to this sermon? Why should you listen to what I'm saying to you today? Does it speak to your deepest need? Does it speak from God's amazing grace? And does it speak for your greatest good? You know, I began this morning talking about the horse whisperer. And uh, the character of Tom Booker in the movie was based on a real life person named Buck Brannaman. And Buck Brannaman is kind of a modern day version of John Solomon Rainey. He's maybe the most famous horse whisperer in the world. He was a consultant on the picture, and he taught uh, Robert Redford how to, how to get inside that character of someone that was able to understand a wounded animal and able to make them feel safe. Uh, one of the things that Buck Brandeman has said is that he got into horses as a young boy because he had experienced painful childhood abuse at the hands of his father. In fact, Buck Brannaman is in the Guinness Book of World Records for his rope tricks and roping. And one of the reasons why is when he was a child, his father would say when he got in trouble that you can either practice roping or take a whipping with that rope. And so today he's in the Guinness Book of World Records. But despite that, his father was an abusive and, and hurtful It was a hurtful relationship. They wound up being removed from the home. They spent several years in foster care. And as a 12-year-old boy, Buck Brannaman discovered horses. And he fell in love with horses. And that became his escape. His escape from a brutal home life. And what he discovered was as he learned and he started dealing with horses, and as he became a horse whisperer, He learned that abused horses are just like abused children. They trust no one and they expect the worst. Why are people hostile and toxic? Because they're hurting. And because of that, they trust no one. And they expect the worst. You know what I think the Bible teaches us? Look at what it says in John 10, 27. We're through. John chapter 10, verse 27. I love this verse. Will you read it with me out loud? My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. My sheep hear my voice. They listen. I know them. And they follow me. I wonder if God is saying to somebody here today, hey, you can trust me. 
and you can expect the best. Because no matter what happens, my mercy, my grace, and my love is going to be yours. Someone has said, no man is more deaf than a person who will not listen. I want you to hear the voice of God today. The voice of comfort. Will you bow your heads with me as we pray? Our heads are bowed and eyes are closed all over this room. Those of you that are joining us online, if you're listening to me right now, I want to just say a word to somebody that's here that has never accepted Christ as your Savior. If you don't know for certain that if you died today, you'd go to heaven, if you're not sure about your relationship with Christ or with God, I want to tell you, God demonstrated his love for you. And that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Friend, if you're here today and you're working your way to heaven and you're trying to earn God's favor, if you're trying to work your way to be a good enough person, I'm going to tell you, today I've got great news for you. Your years of hard service have been completed. You can get out of that army you can get out of that servitude. You can leave that, those chains behind. You can be a brand new person in Christ today. He calls you to salvation in Jesus Christ. By grace, through faith in Jesus Christ. Not by works, nothing that we do. Thank you, Jesus, that you love me. Thank you that you died on the cross for my sin. Come into my heart, come into my life. The best I know how, I put my life in your hands. If you would make that your prayer today, if you want to know Christ, if you want to go God's way, just make that your prayer. Lord Jesus, come into my life. The best I know how, I'm going to trust in you. I'm not just trusting you for my money or for my health or for tomorrow or for my kids. I'm trusting you with my soul. I'm trusting you with my life. I'm trusting Jesus Christ as my Savior and my Lord. Now, if you believe he'll do what he promised, just say, thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Thank you that you see me. Thank you that you forgive me. Thank you that you love me. You may be a believer. You may know Christ. You may have known the Lord for a long, long time. But it may be that today you need to pray this prayer. Lord, thank you for seeing me today, right where I am. Thank you for forgiving me. And thank you for loving me. Do you believe that? Say amen. Now we're going to do a little something here that Bruce Wilkinson and Howard Hendricks did on that stage years ago. Even if you don't know them, would you just turn to somebody next to you and say, he loves you. Would you do that right now? Mom, mom, get the lady behind you. Right behind you. Father, seal these words in our hearts for Jesus' sake, in whose name we pray. Amen.
Amen, amen. God bless you. You can be seated. We're going to be dismissed in just a moment. I want to just tell you, if you're visiting with us here today, if this is your first time being at Grace Point, thanks for being here. Thanks for being a part of our Grace Point family. Uh, If you go to gracepoint.net, click on the word contact, or if you fill out one of those little white welcome cards that should be in the chair in front of you, there's actually a place in that card where you can just Take a screenshot, and it'll take you to a link where you can do your welcome card electronically. But if you'd rather just fill it out by hand, you can do that. Drop it in one of those offering baskets in the back, the boxes on the back wall. You can always give to Grace Point Church. Those who are part of our Grace Point family, you can give in those offering boxes. You can also do it online at gracepoint.net. Click on the word giving or donate. And every time you give, you're helping change the world one life at a time. So we thank you so much for your faithful, sacrificial, generous giving to the ministry here at Grace Point Church. And if you're new here, uh, do us a favor and fill out that little card. You can check boxes either on the card or electronically to get information about the church. You can write a prayer request in the back of the card. And most importantly, listen, if you're here today and you prayed to receive Christ, if you're listening online, you want to accept Christ and go God's way today, Would you fill out one of those little cards and check that box that says, Today, I want to commit my life to Jesus Christ. Because we want to follow up and encourage you. We want to help you to grow in your faith. And I want to remind you, Wednesday night, we have Celebrate Recovery to help with the hurts, the habits, the hang-ups that we all struggle with. I don't know if anybody here is struggling during my sermon, but I have already heard messages that some people had trouble following me because they want to know the answers to the other three blanks. Is there anybody here like Pastor Paul who wants to fill in their blanks? God's voice, his voice offers hope, it offers healing, and it offers help. Now that's exciting. I got to preach another sermon today. That's even better. Offers hope, offers healing, offers help. But we want to encourage you, Wednesday night, Celebrate Recovery. Next Sunday morning is Mother's Day. We're going to have a great time of worship. We're going to have a lot of inspiring music. I'm going to be sharing a message from Isaiah 40, one of the most famous verses in all the Bible. Those who wait on the Lord will renew their strength. If you know somebody that needs a word of encouragement, we're going to, we're going to hear from the voice of strength, God's strength for us next Sunday morning. Hope you'll be here and bring a friend who needs to know Christ as we honor moms and we worship together and have a great, great time. Also, yesterday, our ladies had a wonderful tea, had a ton of women there, had a great time. Let's say thank you to all the people that put that together and for their heart and um, had a wonderful, wonderful time. And uh, there's a ladies' retreat coming up in October. I know that's a long way away, but it's not too early to get registered, get your name on the list, mark your calendar. So you can see Aaron LaCire, wave your hand. Jacqueline Scott, wave your hand. You can see one of these ladies. If you have a question about that, they'll help you get connected. Where's Caroline Sewell? Is she here today? Caroline, how many dentists do we need? We need three more dentists. So if you want to help us, With our dental mobile clinic this summer, we need three more dentists. We've already got seven signed up. We need three more. So if you'll help us, you can see Caroline. Wave your hand if you would. See Caroline if you need to get one of these sheets that is an information sheet to give your dentist to ask them if they'll help. And it gives them points toward continuing education. So it's actually good for them. It's great for the community. And so if you can help us do that, we would really appreciate it. Hey, listen, how many of you are glad you came to church today? Amen? I'm glad I was here. And we're glad that you were here. Thanks for being with us. We look forward to seeing you back next week. God bless you. Have a great week.